quite a number of years ago. The uh, doctor, after doing a routine blood test, said, uh, Dave, your cholesterol is kind of high. Really? I really hadn't heard too much about that at that point. Well, what is that all about? And kind of explained it to me, and he said, we'd like to put you on a diet of, uh, you know, uh, less red meat and, and, you know, more fruits and vegetables and those kinds of things. And it's like, well, okay. And then he said, not so much sweets. And I went, oh, really? (sighs) But we did it. You know, worked on it, worked on it, and it, it came down a little bit, but it was still too high. And he said, well, we do have some medication, and oh, I don't want to go down that road of medication if we don't have to, so kept working at it, kept working at it. You know, heard that exercise was helpful, so worked at those things, and, and again, could bring it down a little bit, but still not to acceptable levels. So finally, we had the conversation. It's like, okay, let's get started on some medication. Here's a stat, and this should be helpful. And sure enough, cholesterol levels went down. I went, great. And then you know what? The temptation to eat whatever I wanted was right there. The medication takes care of it. Look, I tried really hard. I was like super good. I was doing everything right and it only helped a little bit. You take a little pill and pew. Wonderful. And it's hard. Even though I know eating healthy and exercising is good for me, it's still because, say, you kind of look at the big chocolate cake and say, "Ah, the pill will take care of it. No worries. And that's the trouble sometimes with our health care. We feel like we can live whatever way we want, do whatever we want, eat whatever we want, not exercise or anything like that, and you know what? Go to the doctor and, well, there's got to be a pill for that or something, right? And we're not dealing with core healthy issues in our lives. Now, this is not going to be a message on health care. But it is going to be a message on, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? When you ask that kind of a question, I mean, lots of different things can come into mind. There's there's some of the uh, Eastern religions and meditation and yoga that that when they talk about wellness, it's just like, you know, this, this whole balance in life and everything is calm and serene and you push out the bad and you take in the good. There's a lot of healthy stuff in that, but that's not what we're going to talk about this morning. And there's a lot of wellness coaches out there, and they'll talk about balance in life and your occupation, your physical, social, intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and when they're all kind of in sync and working together, that's wellness. And again, there's wisdom in that, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to take a look at things from the biblical viewpoint, how, how, how God sees us. And, and the Hebrew word shalom really is that, the core of true biblical wellness. Shalom means peace, but it starts out with peace with God, peace in our relationship to God. God designed us to be in this healthy, wonderful, loving, uh, obedient relationship to him. And you know what happened? Sin came into this world, Adam and Eve and the serpent and all these things, and they decided they wanted to be like God and do things their way, and it brought all kinds of brokenness into this world. But biblical shalom, biblical health is is what God has done to restore that relationship and make us clean, pure, holy, like we were just singing, and be in that healthy relationship with him. But it doesn't just uh, uh, focus right there. Some people think that the Bible is only about you know, the, 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 the spiritual, the connection, the one-on-one relationship between you and God, and that's it. But no, the Bible speaks of our relationship to others, that shalom extends to others. You love God and you love others as well because sin affects our lives with others. And God wants to bring shalom, wholeness, healing, wellness to those relationships as well. 
And then rounding out the picture is our relationship to all of creation, the physical world. That this world is broken, this world has problems, this world has pain on a physical level. And God's shalom even extends to that. But somehow when we talk about being well, we tend to focus only on the physical and not on the whole picture of what God wants to bring into our lives. We've been working our way through the miracles in the Gospel of John, and we've also noted that these miracles are called by John signs, signs in the Gospel of John, signs of God's kingdom, signs of Jesus' power, indicators that Jesus is the Savior, so terrible it is in Greek. He is the Savior. He's the one that can make all things whole, well, Bring back shalom once again. And so we studied the first week, turning water into wine. And we uh, saw that miracle and we wondered, you know, what kind of a miracle was this all about? But we saw its impact and, and how Jesus is the fulfillment of every human longing and desire. That in the Greek culture uh, of the day, uh, the god Dionysius, the god of wine and women and party and so forth, but it just turned, even though there was a lot of fun, it turned into misery. And John is saying, no, choose Jesus. He is where life is really found. Then last week we talked about the healing in Capernaum and there was this uh, royal official and he comes to Jesus, you know, travels, uh, you know, close to 30 miles, and says, come back, come back to Capernaum to, to heal my son. And Jesus says to him, well, just go, he'll be well. And the guy had to take Jesus at his word to believe it, even though there was no evidence at that point that, that it would be true. He just had to trust Jesus, even when it was difficult. And we saw how in the Greek culture that people would travel many miles to go to the oracle to receive this word from the gods and that they would have to go back home and just trust that that was the way it was. We see how Jesus' word is trustworthy, is powerful, and it makes all the difference. Jesus is the greatest. And then today we're going to look at the healing in the pool of Bethesda and then coming up, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, healing the man born blind, and then finally raising Lazarus from the dead. So the question for today, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Let's look at John chapter 5 together. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Archaeologists for years had never you know, found anything that even approached this. They're kind of looking for a pentagon-shaped building and so forth. But then finally, I think it was in the uh, 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, they discovered a pool, and it, uh, that, that, that pool was... Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Bethesda... Um, the meaning of the, of the word is house of mercy or house of flowing water. And so this was a place of healing, a place of grace and of mercy. Now, this is a model of what was discovered then through archaeology. And you can see then uh, this building. And if you kind of do the one, two, three, four, and five covered colonnades, not a pentagon shape, but two pools separated by a center colonnade. And this was just north uh, then of the temple area. Uh, again, this is a model of the temple in Jerusalem. Here's the Sheep Gate, and here's where the Pool of Bethesda, at least what uh, scholars assume is the Pool of Bethesda, right there. Here is the actual uh, archaeological dig there, and it's kind of hard to make sense of what is what and so forth, but that's just north of the temple area there in Jerusalem. And so it, it confirms God's word again, not that we didn't believe it was true, but to those who just say, you know, does this really make sense? Sure enough, here's another piece of evidence. Well, so this pool is there, this, this pool of Bethesda, and here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and one person who was there had been sick for 38 years. Think about that. 38 years. The lifespan in those days was kind of like, it 
between age 40 to 60. And so most of his life, he had been ill. And this is, for him, a very hopeless situation. He had come to this pool seeking relief, seeking healing. But it just wasn't coming. And so when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, I find that to be kind of an odd question, very interesting at least. Do you want to get well? And I mean, if I was the guy sitting there, I'm going like, duh, (laughs) what do you think? Of course I want to get well, But, but it's an interesting question that, Jesus presents, do you want to get well? What was Jesus implying by that? What was he trying to say? The guy's response, sir, the sick person replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. There was the, the, the belief that an angel would come from time to time, kind of stir the waters uh, of the pool, and the first person in would be the person who would get well. This was not like a 100% cure rate by any means, but that was the belief. That was the feeling going on there. And this guy's like, yeah, I'm lame. There's no one to help me. I can't get there on my own. And it sounds like a lot of excuses to us, doesn't it? Oh, I can't. Oh, you know. And we think, well, come on, guy. Like, you've had 38 years. Figure it out. Figure out a way to get in there, you know. Sounds like a lot of excuses. But what I hear is really a lot of emptiness. We call it hopelessness. The guy has tried. He's done his best, but it's still not working, and he's at a huge disadvantage. He's paralyzed. He's lame. He is immobile, and sure enough, when this event happens, there's plenty of other people way ahead of him, and his world has become empty, hopeless. You know, sometimes when we see people going through a rough time, and to us, the, the solution just seems obvious. <laughs> you don't have any money. Get a job, fella, you know? Or, or, you know, go on a diet or go see a doctor. It's like we can look at people's situation and, like, we can figure this one out pretty easy. If they weren't so lazy, if they weren't so this or so that or whatever, we could tell them. Usually we don't tell them directly to their face. We usually talk about it to somebody else behind their back. You see, it's easy to make lots of judgments about people when we don't know all the circumstances. It's easy to get the whole world figured out if people would listen to our great wisdom, even though we've only spent maybe a a whole minute or so assessing the situation. But it's more difficult to take time to listen, to understand, to care, to hear somebody out. What are they going through? What are the handicaps that they are dealing with? What are the life circumstances which hold them back? What are the deficits going on in their lives? which have prevented them from succeeding or getting better? And then are we willing to come alongside a person like that and not just fix it for them, just give them some money or, you know, whatever sort of a thing, but help them to reach a point that restores hope and restores confidence and the sense of being able to say, you know, I can do this, I can do this. Jesus comes to him and says, do you want to get well? And we're not sure exactly how that question was phrased, but perhaps in that was the encouragement, I can restore hope to you. 
Is that what you want? Do you want to get well? I can be of great help to you. I can change your circumstances. But will it change your heart? Will it change your hope? Will it give you a whole new focus in your life? So Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. It was a whole new day. It was, you know, after 38 years of illness, all of a sudden this guy walks up and says, do you want to get well? And you're like, well, you know, and he says, well, why don't you just get up? And he could. There was a new life in his body. There was a new strength in him that had never been there before. And it's just... When Jesus comes into your life, it changes your world. It makes all the difference. There, there's a whole layer of meaning in this story that I think is tied in with the later discussion about that this all took place on the Sabbath and, and, and the newness and the joy and the new creation of the Sabbath. But, but it's a whole, it would take like a whole other sermon to develop it. So if you want to ask me about it later, feel free. But the day on which all this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders then said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you from carrying your mat. They're all just all about the rules. You can't do that, you know. And the guy says, well, the man who made me well, he's the one who said, pick up your mat and walk. That's like, it's not my fault. It's that guy's fault. The one who healed me, you know. And they're going like, well, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the guy says, he had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And if you think about this, this, this whole scenario, Jesus comes, do you want to get well? The guy you know, shares his story and so forth. Jesus says, you know, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the guy does not have any more interaction. Jesus. There is no, who are you? Or no, thank you. Or no praise to God for this. It's just like, okay, I'm good. I'm on my way. And you see this, this shocking omission of what should have happened in the text. That this man should have been giving glory to God. And instead, he's just kind of like, hey, it's not my fault. Don't get me into trouble. It's his fault. Go get him. His life has not been transformed at its core through this healing. The healing has helped him physically. Don't get me wrong. He's, he's very it, great. This is good. But it has not transformed him internally, spiritually. There's no sense of gratitude to God, praise, or, or discovering who Jesus is. So, I mean, later on, Jesus finds him in the temple and says to him, See, you're well again. And now he says it's something extremely interesting. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. What's that about? And the man goes away and he tells the Jewish leaders, it was Jesus, he's the one who made me well. And this stern warning comes from Jesus. Jesus recognizes that though this man has been physically healed, that on that whole picture of wellness, you know, that that center, that core, God and the others, that's been untouched. The man is not enjoying complete wellness, complete shalom. Maybe he's happy about his physical circumstances, but his heart has not been changed. So he gives a stern warning, stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. And people debate back and forth, you know, about, well, you know, is that how Jesus works? You know, if you don't shape up, I'm going to get you even worse next time. That doesn't quite sound like Jesus. But there's an Interesting, interesting archaeological discovery right next to the Pool of Bethesda. Right there in that same pool area, in fact, it looks like very much associated with it that the two are tied together, is a Greek 
temple, a pagan shrine to the god Asclepius. Asclepius is the god of healing in Greek culture. Asclepius, uh, this is a statue of him, kind of looks like this, um, you know, and uh, one unique characteristic about him, he always has a uh, snake wrapped around a rod associated with him. And people believe that, you know, if you prayed to this god Asclepius and, and went to his temple, uh, some, some uh, of the remedies involve going down into the water, that the flowing waters, the healing waters were very therapeutic and so forth, that you could be healed. And here, right in Jerusalem, right outside the temple, you can see some of the secularization that was going on in Jesus' day is a temple to a foreign god and a place of healing. And this guy had been there for a long period of time. And so the question comes up, was he at the pool of Bethesda because he was looking to the God of Israel for healing? Or had he given up? or whatever reason, and decide, well, let's try this one. Let's try this God. Let's see what he has to offer. And perhaps in this whole dialogue, when Jesus says to him, do you want to get well? Well, the guy is going like, well, well yeah, I mean, of course, but there's no one to help me. No one to help him. Had he been trusting in the very wrong things, the wrong people, the wrong God? And then when Jesus steps into his world and brings the miraculous healing, he's not giving praise to God. He's not rejoicing. He's not looking at Jesus saying, who are you? You must be the son of God, as in so many other healings that Jesus has. Now, when he's questioned about it, he doesn't even know who Jesus is, and when he finds out, he just says, go get him. There's no honor. There's no glory given to the Savior, to the healer, to the one who made all the difference. And it's interesting, when, when Paul writes to the church in Rome about this, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. I mean, Paul saw it, you know, in, in all across the, the Greek and the Roman world. All this godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what, my, what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. It is like you can know God from the creation around us, not in every detail, but in, certainly in the sense of knowing that there is this powerful creator who has put this world together so beautifully that is evident from the world around us. But man's wickedness can't see it. They suppress the truth. And what do they do instead? For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. And I'm thinking, bingo. That's where this paralytic is at. He's neither glorifying God, he doesn't know God, he doesn't glorify God, and he doesn't give thanks to God. That om great omission is there. He has suppressed the truth with a lie. Their thinking has become futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then Paul says, although they claim to be wise, they become fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Wow. Paul hit the nail on the head. He had that world pegged. 
That's what the whole Greek God system was all about, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings, birds, animals, and reptiles, including that snake. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires and their hearts, their sexual impurity for degrading their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. So the question to that guy, and the question to John's original readers is, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Remember, our picture of wellness, you know, God at the center, and then flowing out toward others and all of creation. But what people have done is that they've exchanged God for an idol, exchanged God for a lie. Instead of wellness, they have illness, and their whole world is dark and drab. And the Apostle John is writing to a people in a culture wrapped up big time in the midst of that. We looked at this map before and we saw that uh, John is writing most likely from Ephesus here, just this huge uh, city in Asia Minor. Um, and then last time we looked at how close uh, Didyma was there and that uh, oracle of Didyma. Well, did you know that up here in Pergamum, not too far away, was the world-class temple complex to Asclepius. And Asclepion is a whole temple complex and it included a whole medical center, a library with 200,000 volumes on the medical healing arts, kind of like a whole wellness uh, therapy healing center, uh, lectures on, on, on diet and exercise and relaxation, and people could go there and for a fee receive all of this wisdom and enter into these healing waters, these rushing waters. And Asclepius was known of a, as a god of mercy, soter, savior. And people would go there and worship there and hope that this god could heal them. In fact, found at this uh, archaeological site, first of all, is a pillar. Um, see the snakes there? Again, in honor of the god Asclepius. And then uh, these white stones were testimonies of people who had been healed, giving glory to the gods for the healing that they had received, their testimony of, of what God had done for them. It was a way to give thanks and honor to the gods. And this is what the people in John's day are dealing with. You're sick? Psh, go up to Pergamum. That's where the God is strong. That's where all this, this knowledge and, and healing are. Trust in this. Maybe, maybe you will get well. And John, I believe in including this story, this healing of Jesus is challenging the culture of his day to say, who are you trusting in? Who do you believe in? Who do you turn to when you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Let's fast forward to today. Okay, a little, little cultural quiz here. What is that? What does that stand for? Do you see those symbols around? Medical people, right? Medicine, hospitals, doctors, ambulances carry this symbol with the rod of Asclepius in it. Okay? Now, that's, that's part of the whole history and tradition of the medical arts and practices and, and, and so forth, but it's interesting, the parallel. Now, word of caution. Do not walk out of here saying, Pastor Dave believes we should not in use medicine, okay? <laughs> I'm serious. I, it sounds funny, but there are Christian groups that are going to go down that road and say, no medical, that's pagan. We're only going to trust in God to heal us. 
I believe God has given us medicine as a tool, a very, very helpful tool. And a lot of our modern medicine today has been developed with this understanding that God gives healing. And so don't go to your doctor and slap them in the face and say, look at that stupid snake there on, on your, you know, okay? But the question is, is in whom are you trusting for healing? The pills? The surgery? The procedure? The renowned world-class medical clinic or hospital? This famous doctor? Or is God at the center of your trust for healing? Now, I believe he has given us wonderful doctors, hospitals, pills, tools, diagnostics, all of that. And God uses these things to bring wellness. But no true wellness will happen if God is not at the center of it. Who do we thank? Do we thank anyone when we get well? Do we take time to say, thank you, God, for this doctor, this pill, this medical procedure, or whatever it may be, because you have used that, or maybe in spite of it, to bring healing to me? Who do we first call or talk to or consult when we've got a problem? Now, there's nothing wrong with talking to doctors and medical personnel, but are we also bringing it to the Lord? And in which order? How many times do we hear the expression or say the expression? Well, all we got left to do is pray. Why don't we do that first? Why don't we do that first? God guides us to the appropriate doctors and treatment and so forth to get well. Who am I retrusting in? Whom are we trusting in? But there's something even deeper that, that, that goes on here when we ask the question, do you want to get well? Because again, and I want to say this, this graciously, but still hear the truth in that. Because like the guy at the pool of Bethesda, when we think of wellness, we think of physical wellness. When we pray, we're praying for physical healing. We want to get better. We want to be healthier, stronger, get out, do the things that we kind of, you know, want to do and so forth. And so the whole focus of our attention and so forth is on getting physically better. Nothing wrong with that. But sometimes it misses the big picture of wellness. And sometimes God chooses not to give us physical wellness, but instead have us focus on spiritual wellness instead. I'm not trying to bring judgment against any person. I'm just saying evaluate. When you pray and when you think your prayers have not been answered, what happens to your faith? What happens to your trust? Are you saying, well, God is worthless. He didn't heal me. Or is God working through that disability to give you greater ability, but perhaps not physical? Ruth has a uh, cousin whose daughter is dealing with leukemia, early 30s, one young child, just a year old, vivacious gal, full of life, believers, love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, diagnosed with leukemia. 
And at first it was just like, yep, we're going to beat this thing. We've got, you know, great doctors and trusting and, and, and so forth. And, you know, we're, and then they went through that first round of chemo and it was awful. And, and uh, leukemia was still there. It was devastating. And then you could kind of feel their faith going, God, what, what, we, were, we were believing that you were going to bring the healing. What's going on here? But yet, God, we want you to be glorified through all this. We want you to receive the honor, so we're going to trust you for the healing. And that has continued on now for months, up and down, up and down, emotional roller coaster and spiritual roller coaster for them. There's a point about a month and a half ago in which they gave her 48 hours to live. It just, her, her body looked like it was just shutting down. And the family is just crying out, God, what's going on here? And then miraculously, she, she turned around. But she's not out of the woods yet. The last chapter of this story has not been written. In fact, it's still very much up in the air. What's going to happen to her physically? We don't know. She's going to live or die. But through it all, I believe a trust is deepening. Trusting in the God of life and death. Trusting in the God who holds our whole lives here on this earth and for eternity in his hands. It's wonderful to pray for longer physical life and better physical health, but friends, there comes a point in time in which, unless Jesus returns first, we're all going to die. It's going to happen. Death has a pretty high rate. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And so Jesus is asking each of you this morning, in whom are you trusting? What are you trusting for the whole of your life? Do you want to get well? Or the question that the writers of the Heidelberg Catechism asked, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is, is that I'm not my own. But I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Whether Shannon lives or dies, we don't know. What will be the road up from here? But she is learning how to say and how to sing through all the scars and problems and pain that she is going through to know it is well with my soul. In prayer. Lord Jesus, like a guy by a pool, sometimes maybe we're trusting in the wrong thing, looking to the wrong resources for healing. We focus on the physical when you're much, much more concerned with the eternal. And so, Lord, if there's people here today, whether themselves, family members, friends, who are, who are wrestling in, in illness, we do pray for physical healing. But more importantly, Lord, is it well with their soul? Are they trusting your name? Are they walking in your ways? Are they bringing glory and thanks to you and honoring you as the God of healing, the Savior the one who cares for us in life and in death. We belong to you. Lord Jesus, help us. 
to keep you at the center of our focus, the center of our world, that you are the source of all shalom and wellness. In your name we pray.